Well, life in the, the year 2018, it can be pretty hectic. With work and school and t-ball games and dance recitals and birthday parties and mowing the lawn and making dinner and doing laundry and getting to your community group and cleaning out the garage and attempting to just get a few more hours of sleep before the baby wakes up for a third time in a row, life can be hectic. And it seems to me that there's no real end in sight. In the culture we live in today, people are just getting more and more and more busy. More and more things are going on and people have more and more on their plate. We're all busy these days. And if you're anything like me, you have a tension wrestling within you right now when you're so busy because you're struggling to do whatever it takes to just try to find ways to just connect with God with some sort of value or or substantive time and attention. I got to be honest with you. I'm going to have a confession this morning as we start this message. My prayer life, especially lately, it has taken a back seat to the sovereignty of my calendar. With so much stuff going on and so many things happening, for me, a prayer is typically just short Sweet and surface level. I'll give you some typical examples of prayer in the Berkebean household. So you're, you're, you know, everybody has their stock uh, dinner prayer, right? Kids are crying. Baby is freaking out over there. You need to give the baby food soon. We need to pray quickly so it's done. So it's just, Father, just pray that we have a good meal. You bless us, food, our bodies. Amen. Or you got the typical bedtime one, right? Pray that we all have a good night's sleep so that we have strength for tomorrow. Amen. Or you have the typical one if you're in the car getting ready to go north. Just pray that we've got, you know, traveling or journeying mercies so we arrive there safely. Amen. This is usually like the extent of my prayer life. Short, sweet, and surface level. Because what do we really have time to do, right? We don't have much more time outside of that. This is kind of the way that we live our life. And so I guess I have to ask myself the question, is that okay? Is it okay that prayer for me in my life is always short, sweet, and surface level? Well, I don't know. Let's find out. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14 with me for a second. Uh, If you have a seatback Bible in front of you, you can turn there. Matthew is the beginning of the New Testament, so it's about two-thirds of the way into your Bible. And uh, it's going to be, yeah, again, Matthew chapter 14. If you want to use a, a phone, that's cool. We've got a, even a phone on our, our mobile app. So if you want to download our mobile app, that's for free. And we've got a, phone, or a, a Bible built in there that you can use just that as well. Uh, and if you don't have a physical Bible, like at home, the Bible in front of you, just take it home. That's our gift to you. You're welcome to use that and just take that home and keep it. But Matthew chapter 14, I, 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 there's an intriguing passage There's a character here in Matthew chapter 14, and he's very busy. And this is not a story from 2018. This is a story from like 28 AD. And the person who's busy in this story is none other than Jesus. And he is swamped. If you think you're busy, Jesus in Matthew chapter 14 is far busier than you are, I guarantee it. In this chapter... He has people to heal and disciples to lead and crowds to teach and take care of. And there's no end in sight to the busyness. He's just inundated with noise and activity and responsibility. And nobody gives him a moment break. In fact, we even read in verse 13 of chapter 14. Look what it says. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Now, let me just help you understand this for a second. No cell phones in 28 AD. Like right now for you, if you want to detach, you don't want someone to bug you from the office, you go on vacation, you just turn off the phone. That's what you you can do. Here, there's no phones. So you would think in 28 AD, if you get on a boat and go to the boonies in the middle of nowhere, to a desolate place, you'd think you can get some escape from all the busyness. But Jesus does this and they follow him. No cell phone. They they just are watching Jesus, and they're like, I think he might be over there somewhere. Let's all go run and find Jesus. He's so busy, he can't get a break. And so because you would think, and the disciples, in fact, they encourage him, just why don't you just shoo these people away? Get them out of here, Jesus. You need a break. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus looks at them, he has compassion on them, and he begins to heal the sick. 
And he begins to take care of their needs. In fact, he tells the disciples, why don't you feed these people? And they say, there's way too many people here. There's, there's thousands and thousands of people here. There's no way we can feed them. We only have some, a few loaves and some fish. We, we can't do that. And Jesus says, okay. And he ends up, as we know, feeding the multitudes, caring for these people. And immediately after he does that, notice what it says in verse 22 now. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds after feeding them. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now, I have read this passage numerous times, and normally I just keep on reading and I don't think about it. But for whatever reason this week, as I was thinking about my prayer life, and I was reading this passage, and I was thinking about how busy I am, when I read this verse, it was kind of like Jesus punched me in the stomach. And I'll tell you why. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was raised from the dead, the one who who all things were created through Jesus, Scripture tells us, if this Jesus, in the midst of the busyness, needed to find a place to go, to be isolated in order to pray, what makes me think that in my crazy, chaotic life, I can continue to live this out, this really shallow, surface-level prayer, and that's sufficient? Like, Jesus had to go to a mountain to pray, and he's Jesus. And I'm like an idiot, a knucklehead. Like, how on earth can I just go, yeah, my prayer life's pretty good, when Jesus, like, he legit had to find a mountain to pray. If Jesus had to do that to pray, I'm in trouble, and I'm willing to bet we're all in trouble. Because if you're like me and you have a pretty shallow prayer life, I think something maybe needs to change in my life. I need to reform a few areas of my life. If I'm far too distracted to spend time talking to the creator of the universe who desires for me to speak with him, and I'm too busy, it's a problem. In fact, if you travel other places in the world, there are many cultures where Christian communities have a much more robust, vibrant prayer life than we do in America. We're far too busy, far too distracted, and I... I will be honest, I feel like the church in America needs to take some time to get off our smartphones and to get on our knees more often. We're so busy, we're so distracted, but yet prayer is an essential part of the Christian life. And so something's got to change. We we need to begin to reform this this much-needed spiritual discipline in our life, prayer. I'm not talking about just spending more time mumbling off the same rehearsed prayers that you always do and doing that more frequently. I'm not talking about checking off some box. Oh, I prayed today. That's done. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm talking about actual, thoughtful, substantial, God-honoring prayer. We need more of this in our life. It's essential. It's not only the means by which we communicate with God, but it's often the means by which God works in our life is through prayer, and it deserves our attention. So this next several weeks, as a church, we have decided, if this is the case, if we need to work on our prayer life, let's spend several weeks now, or I don't know, four or five weeks in a row, talking about the topic of prayer. Let's work on this together as a church, reforming our prayer life, taking a crash course in what biblical prayer should be all about. We're going to be heading up the mountain together, people, working on our prayer. And as we go on this journey together, we've got an instructor that's going to go along with us. This guy's name is the Apostle Paul. He has several really good prayers in the scriptures. And so what we're going to do is we'll take a prayer each week. We'll dissect the prayer and we'll try to learn truth from the way that Paul prays. And hopefully that will inform us in the way in which we should pray. Make sense? We're calling this series Praying Like Paul. So for the next several weeks, this is where we're at. And I am blessed with the opportunity to begin by preaching from Ephesians chapter 3. So go ahead and now turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. If you're already in Matthew, you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, get a little smaller. Yeah, so Ephesians is a little smaller there. Ephesians chapter 3. And as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 3, I just want to give you a little context. This book is written by Paul to a church that he planted, the church of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus, this was located in Asia Minor. This is a a, a modern-day Turkey. It was on the coast of Turkey uh, in the Mediterranean. And so if you were to travel there today, it's a coastal area, although uh, the shore has depleted because of all the silt that was there. And so so basically, shore is a lot further away than where it was before in in ancient Ephesus. And in 
ancient Ephesus, uh, in that, uh, that region, there was a diverse group of people. This would have been like the New York City of today. If you go to New York, you get people who speak different languages and different cultures and different backgrounds, different religious experiences, different races, all different people. And it was very similar in the ancient world in Ephesus. And so in Ephesus, you had all these diverse people in this port city who were living there. And Paul planted a church. And now Paul is writing a letter of instruction to this church in Ephesus. And he's praying in chapter 3 that this church would be strengthened. It's a prayer for strength we're talking about today. And the first thing we're going to see as we examine the opening section of this prayer is Paul's prayer for strength that begins with the number one infrastructure of prayer. If you want to fill the blank, fill in the blank thing, you can write this in. It's the infrastructure of prayer. That's a big word, but if you know me, I like to do alliteration, so I had to find an I word to start this out. So foundation maybe would have been better. I don't know, but infrastructure is what I'm doing. The infrastructure of prayer. What is the foundational thing that Paul's doing that establishes this prayer for us? What's the platform or basis? Well, notice how he begins the prayer in verse 14. The Apostle Paul begins to make his, this is an incredible prayer. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now, I know that nobody does letters anymore these days. Um, but for those of you who remember what letters were like, when people would write you a letter, they would usually write a number of things in there. And if at any point in the letter, maybe the middle of it, let's say, someone said, for this reason, or because of that, blah, blah, blah. If you're smart, you would want to know what that is, right? You wouldn't typically read in the beginning of someone's letter, for this reason, and then just keep going like it doesn't matter. But we often do that with the Bible, don't we? We kind of like just read it in the middle and don't know what's happening. So if Paul begins his letter by saying, for this reason, he has some sort of foundational thing he said previously that's, that's the structure. It's providing the infrastructure for this prayer. And so good students of the Bible, we should always try to investigate. What is this reason? What's the reason that Paul is praying? What's, the, what, what, what's going on here? What's the infrastructure? That's the logical question we need to ask. And so we need to begin to search the scriptures. Now, if we want to know the reason for Paul to pray, and he says, for this reason, and we begin to search, usually what you do is you look at the verse before that, right? If someone was, says something and they say, for this reason, usually that's where you'd find it. But it's weird here in Ephesians chapter 3 because that's actually not where you find it. The, the foundation for Paul's prayer is actually found in chapters 1 and 2, not earlier in chapter 3, and let me show you why. This is super nerdy, I'm sorry, but I, I like this stuff and it helps me study the Bible and understand it, okay? So if, you, if you're not into nerdy stuff, you can just like do something, talk amongst yourself or something for a minute. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Notice what it says. For this reason, so the same thing Paul says, this is now in the beginning of the chapter. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and then notice that. See that little dash there? That's, he's interrupting himself. So his introduction says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Then he goes, uh, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly, blah, 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 and he talks and goes on and on and on. It's like an aside. Or it's a parenthetical thought. That's maybe using a bigger expression, right? So Paul is saying something, and then he's like, oh, hold on. I'm going to digress for a second and explain, and I'm going to go back to my thoughts. So, so verses 2 in chapter 3 all the way through verse 13, it's a digression. It's a parenthetical thought. It's an aside. Paul began to say something, and then he's like, oh, let me just explain this. And then he goes back to what he was going to say. So so does that make sense? Are you all tracking with me? This is the nerdy stuff I just want to bring your attention to. So when we get to verse 14, Paul is reiterating what he was about to say in verse 1. He says in verse 1, for this reason, then he has an aside, and then he comes back to me and goes, okay, for this reason, which would mean chapters 1 and 2 are the foundation of Paul's prayer. So what's going on in chapters 1 and 2? Well, we don't have time to, to read it all or explain it all, but let me just give you like the one and a half minute synopsis. Ephesians chapters 1 and 2. Paul is talking about God's sovereignty through redemption. And what I mean by that is the death, burial, and resurrection. God is sovereign over this because what he had Jesus do ended up bringing lost people to himself. So in the city of Ephesus in particular, you have people who are different kinds of people, diverse backgrounds and races and, and religions and all different people. They're lost. 
But Jesus dies in the cross, he's buried, he rises from the dead, and this good news is preached to them. And when they hear the good news of Jesus and trust in this gospel, trust in Jesus Christ, God takes lost people and he brings them near and joins them together in a family. So now all these diverse people in Ephesus who belong to the church, they're one united family of God's people. They're a renewed humanity of God's chosen people, beloved people. They become part of the church. They're diverse, they're separate, they're different, but through the gospel, God unites them and brings them together, and they're established as one. This is what he talks about in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. And at the very end of chapter 2, Paul begins to use some some, uh, language to illustrate this connection, this unity. What does he say? Well, he says specifically at the end of chapter 2 that this church now that's been brought together, these people of God, they're a household. And he even uses architectural language. He says, now this church is growing into a holy temple, being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So this church in Ephesus, they're like a temple, housing the living God. And they're being built up and brought together and brought near, and they're all one united church. This is the infrastructure. This is Paul's point. This is what he's referring to when he says, for this reason I bow my knees. You see, Paul is making a prayer here that the church would be unified and built up and strengthened and established because they were diverse and different, and through the gospel, God has brought them near into one family, and now Paul's hope is they'd be strengthened. Does that make sense? This is the infrastructure. This is the the foundation. Paul is aligning his prayer with the redemptive work of God. Paul is focusing his prayer on God's will and joining together different, diverse people under one family, one household for God. Paul's prayer is saturated and rooted and, 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 and springs forth from the gospel. Awesome. So I just want to encourage you. I'm going to kind of do this throughout the message. I'm going to jump back and forth from kind of instruction to application What's the foundation or motivation of your prayer? Is it rooted in the gospel and what God has done in your life and what God is doing through the church? Is that the foundation? Is that, is that the motivation for your prayer, resting and relying and thinking and meditating upon what Jesus has done for you? Or is it like, hey, God, I pray that we have a good night's sleep so I'm not tired tomorrow? Right? Like my prayer. I'm not trying to like diss short, simple prayers God still hears, but that's like my, that's the extent of my prayer, shallow. No real foundation, no real root. It's mostly focused on me, not focused on God or the gospel or anything God is doing. Are your prayers self-centered or are they gospel-centered? Mine are often self-centered. I like to pray for things that I want or need or that make me more comfortable or, or, or en- enjoy the experience more. That's, my, that's the foundation. That's the motivation of most of my prayers. It's about my passion. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, James tells us in his epistle that there is a problem with that. That's not very good prayer because he says, you ask and do not receive because you asked wrongly to spend it on your passions. Is the foundation of your prayer about your passion, your desire, your will, or God's will? Is it something more rooted in the gospel? Man, when we pray, we need to have the right motivation, the right foundation. Prayer is not primarily about accomplishing our own will. It's a recognition of God's will. God's will be done. And that's what we see here in Ephesians 3. The foundation is gospel-centered. That's what biblical prayer is all about. So that's the infrastructure of Paul's prayer. Now let's move into the the meat of the prayer, right? So what specifically does he pray for? I'm calling this the ingredients of Paul's prayer. What things does he include in his prayer that are valuable for us to think through and, and meditate upon for our prayer? Well, let's begin by looking at verses 16 through 17. Paul prays that according to the riches of his glory... He, God, may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So this is a prayer for strength for the church in Ephesus, but notice it's not a surface level prayer. This is not a nourish me with this food so I'm strong. This is a much deeper uh, kind of prayer. This is a much different kind of strength. It's a deeper strength. This is strength in our inner being that Paul is praying for. Strengthen our inner being. What what does that mean? What does inner being mean? Well, literally in the Greek, 
these are two words. It's ego anthropos, and if you know some of that, it's, it's inner man. Inner being, inner man. And Paul uses this language frequently in Scripture, talking about the inner man and the outer man. Uh, one great classic example is from 2 Corinthians. So this shall hopefully help us understand what inner being means. Paul says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer man is wasting away. Our inner man is being renewed day by day, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about the difference, this dichotomy between outer man and inner man. And our outer man, it's wasting away. This is my body. This is what I usually pray for, right? Outer things, external things, tra- th- things that, are, that, are, that are, you can touch, tangible things. And, and I know myself, I know my outer man, it's wasting away. I'm beginning to feel it. I'm in my mid-30s now, and I've obviously my hair looks like I'm in my mid-60s, but <laughs> like, that's because my body is declining. That's what happens. So now, before I do anything physical, like I did when I was 20, I got a stretch, right? Otherwise, my knees hurt, my back hurts. That's just the way life works. Our outer self declines. It gets older and decays more and more as we age. But see, in this passage, we read about the fact that our inner man, it's being renewed day by day. It shouldn't be declining. It should be growing stronger and stronger. Because if we're in Christ Jesus, this inner being, this inner man, who we are inside, it's getting stronger and becoming more and more like Jesus. This is why I love, like, really old people who are really godly, and, you know, they're, like, walking around, and you're like, I could literally just push you with one finger, and you would fall over. But spiritually, you're like a a beast, a champ, and a prayer warrior. I love it when I see people like that, because their outer self is wasting away, but their inner being, their inner man, man, that's so strong. It's being renewed day by day. And this is what Paul is talking about. He's praying for this. Strength in our inner man. Now, why does Paul pray for strength specifically in our inner man? Well, notice he says this. He gives us an explanation. So that Christ, he says, he prays for strength in the inner man, so Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, this is a confusing verse. Sometimes we just read things and don't think about it. Paul is writing to a church, right? A church consists of Christians who are believers, right? The moment we believe in Jesus Christ... What does the Holy Spirit do? Lives inside us. Like the Spirit makes his dwelling inside us. We have the Spirit of Christ living inside of us the moment we believe. It happens like that, in an instant. I I passed from death to life. I I was dead spiritually. I'm alive spiritually. Now I have the Spirit of Christ. I have the the Holy Spirit living within me, and, and he's residing within me. And so if Paul is writing to a bunch of Christians, why is he praying for for strengthen their inner being so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Isn't Christ already in their hearts? Isn't that a strange thing to pray for? Well, I think what Paul is getting at is far deeper than just that. There's something profound Paul is saying, and I want to explain this by using an illustration. Illustrations are helpful for me. Hopefully it's helpful for you. So, uh, growing up, my wife and I, uh, we knew each other. We were babies in the nursery together, and then we saw each other sporadically throughout life, and then uh, later on uh, in college and post-college, I saw her a couple times, and, uh, and the last time I saw her before we started dating, or the first time I saw her, before, whatever it was, so when I saw her when we were older, before we started dating, and, and I noticed how pretty she was and, and how great she was, we happened to be hanging out one night, and it was that first night, and she was telling me about this house she's about to move into. So she had got this house with some other girlfriends, and they were going to move in together. And uh, part of that process, though, this house was nasty. Like, they had to, like, scrub everything. They painted all the walls after scrubbing all the walls. They had to scrub all the uh, cabinets because it was full of grease. The carpet, I think, had been there for, she said, like, I don't know, 40 years, something crazy. It was there forever. It smelled. was, like, never cleaned. Tore all that out, ended up uh, cleaning, you know, everything. They even remodeled. Her parents came in and helped her remodel a bathroom because there was one tiny bathroom under a stairwell that was not enough for, like, four girls living there. And so they decided to remodel and do another bathroom. And so all this work they do, and she's telling me about this that night. And then that night she goes, hey, uh, do you want to help me move in tomorrow? We need some more people to help out. Now, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm not an idiot. When a pretty girl asks you to do something, you do it, right? So... 
She happened to be a Christian as well, so it was like a double bonus. Perfect. This pretty Christian girl wants me to help her move in. I'll do whatever you want. That's fine. Sweetheart, no problem. Just give me your phone number and we can figure this out. <laughs> so that's what we do. We exchange numbers and I show up the next day and I work the entire day helping her move in. I bring in stuff. Bring in, I even move in all her roommates. Right? So we're then there and I, I see this house. It's very girly, the way they've decorated it. And eventually we begin to date and we uh, get engaged. And then I get married and then I get to kick out the roommates. Okay, and I get to be the roommate, right? So I'm now there with my wife, but the house is kind of girly. And so, you know, I got to change some of that. There's some things I need to do. So like the one room with the pink um, walls, like that's going to be changed and that becomes an office. And that was a place where I would study and I was going to school at the time. And so I use that. And then like I have like instruments, my guitar would go up. and it became, it became my house, right? It was her house and her roommates and then it became my house. Well, then we started to have kids, right? She got, we, she got pregnant, so we decorated the nursery. One of the spare bedrooms became a nursery. And then we have more kids. So the, the, the baby who got a little older went into the other room, and then another baby went in the nursery. And so more and more, for the course of seven years we lived there, the house became more and more our home. It wasn't a nasty, ragged, dirty old house like it started. It was being renovated and changed, and more and more it became an embodiment of who we are. It reflected our nature and character in a really profound way. It became an extension of our being, this house, after seven years. This was not just a house. This was our home, the place where we belonged. And here in Paul's prayer, I think he's making the same point. Paul is praying for strength in our inner being so that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith. The point is not that Christ was absent in the believer's heart. The point is Paul is asking for strength in their inner being so that they, they could begin to renovate aspects of their heart and life in such a way that they begin to reflect and embody Jesus who is dwelling within them. Does this make sense? Paul is praying that, that, that these believers' lives will be transformed in such a way that they are a comfortable dwelling place for, for God, for Jesus Christ. This is the point. He's praying that this would be a dwelling place suitable for the living God. That doesn't happen in a moment. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes renovation. Not physical strength, not shallow kind of strength. Deep inner being strength that God can provide according to his glorious riches. And this is what Paul is praying for. So let me ask you this morning. Is your inner being a place where Christ is comfortable? Is your inner being, is your spiritual life a place where Jesus would want to live? Does it reflect him? Does it embody Jesus? Has it been transformed in such a way where Christ can say, yeah, this is home. This is not just a house. This is home. But you got some work to do. Does your inner being need some renovation? Mine does. Like, I realize that, that my inner being, it's not fully a place where, where Christ is comfortable at this point. I got some work to do. Jesus has got some walls to paint. He's got some carpet to rip out, right? I probably got some closets that I really don't want Jesus to see. Let's just keep that closet over there. Jesus, you use this part of the house. This closet can be over here. And Jesus is like, no, I want to open up the closet and clean it out. This is my home. What's your inner being like? Are you praying for strength in your inner being or are you keeping your prayers shallow and surface level? I need to be praying not only for my inner being and for my kids and for my wife, but for our church, for our inner being to be strengthened so that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith, that he might call us home. So this is what Paul prays for. Not only this, he continues his prayer. Notice what he says now in the next couple verses. He prays that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice here, not only is Paul praying for strength in our inner man, he's also praying for strength in our mind and heart. Now, why does Paul feel the need to ask for strength in this way? Well, notice specifically he's praying for strength in our mind and heart to know the love of Christ. Paul is not praying that we love Jesus more. 
in this prayer. That's a good thing. We certainly need that. We should pray for that. But in this prayer, Paul is praying that we might have strength in our mind and heart to know how much God loves us because the reality is we can't grasp the magnitude of God's love for us in our own faculties. It's not possible. God's love is far greater than anything you can imagine. It's incomprehensible. We can't understand it or grasp it. And this is why Paul is praying for supernatural strength to help us grasp the love that God has for us, the love that Christ has for us deeply. And he's not just saying this is not just some sort of theoretical thing that, that's comprehended in our, in our head, in our mind. That's why I'm saying mind slash heart. Paul says this is a love that surpasses knowledge. It's experience. This is experiential understanding that we know, we feel it in our bones. Jesus loves us so very much. This is Paul's prayer. That we know, that we grasp, that we embrace more fully the love that Christ has for us. And Paul makes this prayer for a specific reason. He, he wants us to grasp this love greater because he wants us to be filled with all the fullness of God. Right? So he says, so that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's why I, he wants us to be strengthened in our mind and heart to know the love of Christ so we might be filled with the fullness of God. What does that mean? What does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? Well, if you read the next chapter, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul explains this and he explains that being filled with the fullness of God, it's to become mature. It's to grow. It's to be mature. And if we are God's children, this shouldn't be a surprise to us. This should make sense. If we're God's children, one of the ways that we mature is by grasping how much God loves us. That's pretty natural. If you ever, I've taken up some child psychology classes, and I worked a little bit in the social service field for a while, and, and if you ever took a class like that, you know that children, in, in order for them to grow, one of the things they need developmentally is they need to know mommy and daddy love them, right? So if you have a, a kid in abuse or a neglect, neglected home, where, where they don't experience love, they struggle developmentally. We, I mentioned before, we were a foster family. We took in one kid, his name was Michael, and he came in when he was three. This is not actually him, but it just, it's a cute kid, and so hopefully it tugs at your heartstrings a little bit. Right. Michael came into our home at three. Terrible family life. Didn't experience love in his home. In fact, we heard his mom say that she didn't love him. She didn't want him to be happy, was what she said, because she wasn't happy. So Michael lived with us, and uh, when he first came, he was way behind developmentally because he, he, didn't, he was neglected and abused. And then after being with us for about four years in a family where we loved him and we, we treated him like a brother and we took care of him and he knew and experienced the love that we had for him over those four years, by the time he left, he'd actually caught up developmentally to other kids his age. Because knowing and experiencing and being saturated by love, this love of a family, it helped him developmentally to, to grow. And I think the same thing is true in our spiritual life. Like one of the ways we grow more mature spiritually is by knowing the love that Christ has for us. And not just knowing it in our head, having it travel to our heart, experiencing, knowing, feeling that love that Christ has for us. That helps us develop and grow We're God's children, and he loves us so deeply. And Paul's prayer is for us to know that, to know it deeply, so that way we might mature and have the fullness of God. And so is this something we're praying for? That we might know the love? That, man, let me tell you, God loves you so much. So deeply. Whatever you're wrestling with, whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, whatever... You might be feeling right now, feeling rejected, worthless, not valuable. That's a lie. God loves you so, so deeply. He loves you. If you're trusting in Jesus, you are his child. Paul prays for us to know this so we might mature and grow in our faith. And we should be praying for this for ourselves, for our kids, for each other, to know this love of Christ. It's so easy to focus on the temporary, transient things in our life, these 
tangible things we see, they're here for a moment and gone, but it's so much harder to, to focus on these deep, heart-level prayers that Paul has here. And, and, and I'm just, let me just encourage you, man, soak this stuff up in your prayer life. It's so important. These things have eternal impact. And so Paul, as he wraps up his prayer, not only praying for strength in their inner being, but praying for strength in their mind and heart to, to comprehend and grasp the love that Christ has for them so they might be mature, he ends up wrapping some of this up and he has kind of an overarching agenda for his prayer that he lists here. And, and let's read it now at the very end of the, the, the prayer. Paul says, Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. Let me just pause there for a second. If you're kind of like, hey, Pastor Joe, yes, we're excited about this prayer thing. This is great, like, but my life is crazy. There ain't no mountains around me. We live in mid-Michigan. Like, I'm not going to a mountain to pray. Like, sometimes all I got is a short couple words. There's good news, right? There's grace for us as believers. We want to pursue a more healthy, uh, intentional, focused prayer life. I want to encourage you and, and, not, and not diminish from that. But at the same time, let me say, in your prayer and in your insufficiency of your prayer, like he's able to do far more abundantly than you think or ask. So take heart. Like God's going to take your prayer and he can do way more than your prayer. You, you, can't, you can't even comprehend what God can do and does do. So take heart in that. He, he can do far more than we can think or ask. So Paul says, to him who's able to do far more than we think or ask according to the power at work within us, and this is awesome, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What is the intent of Paul's prayer? What is the ultimate goal? He prays for strength in the inner man, and he prays for strength in our mind and heart, not ultimately so that we become better, even though that's good. It's ultimately so God is glorified through our life. Beloved, the, the reason we need to change on the inside is not primarily for us. It's because we primarily belong to God. So that he might be glorified. We might be living sacrifices, pleasing to God the way in which we live. And I don't know about you, but my prayer, the goal of my prayer, it's often me. My want, my need, my desire. Is that what you're praying for? Is your focus yourself? Mine is... And Paul's is God's glory. That's the overall agenda. That's the desire. That's, that, that's the place he wants to land, is that whatever happens, God might be glorified. And I know this is difficult, right? I get it. I'm in the thick of this with you. I've got four kids. Four. It's crazy. It's like, I get it. I'm, I'm living this with you. I know how hard this can be. I know how difficult it can be to have focused, thoughtful God-honoring prayers. It's so much easier for me to keep it short and sweet and surface level, but beloved, we cannot be content with saying that that prayer is sufficient. We've we, we got to try to move beyond the surface. We've got to try to bask in biblical prayer. And so our big idea just this morning is this. It's real simple. I've said it 20 different times. If our prayers are to be shaped by Scripture, we need to focus on what's happening beneath the surface. Like our prayer life is far deeper than just the circumstance we're facing at that moment. It's about our spiritual life. You praying for your spiritual life, praying for strength in your inner man, praying for strength to grasp in your mind and heart the love of Christ. Are you praying for that? Are you praying for that for your kids? Are you praying for that for your spouse? Are you praying for that for the church? And we've got to move past the surface. We need to be praying like Paul. That's our goal this week. And so I just want to leave you with that. I don't know exactly how you're going to do it, right? I'm not the master of your calendar. I know I got to change some things in my calendar. I need to be intentional. If I don't actually block out time for prayer this week, I will not do it. Even if it's five minutes, it's five minutes more than last week. I guarantee it. And so whatever you got to do, I want to challenge you practically to pray this week. How are you going to do it? Maybe you need a boat and you need to go to a desolate place. Maybe you need to go to a mountain. I don't know where they are at, but they're not around here. Find one. Do what you got to do. But take some time to pray this week. Focus on what's happening on the inside, not just the outside. Pray for each other. Pray for the church. And do that so that we might be strengthened, but more than that, that God might be glorified. Let's pray.
Father, as we wrap up this first message, I just pray that you would just remind us of the pattern we saw here, Father, this morning as we pray and close now, that, Father, that there is a foundation to this prayer and infrastructure with which, Father, we come before you because, Father, we know that we cannot approach you in prayer with any kind of sense of confidence or comfort apart from the shed blood of your son, Jesus. In fact, we read in the book of Hebrews that because of what your son Jesus has done, we can now come boldly to the throne of grace, Father. It's through the gospel that we even have a platform with which we can speak to you. And Father, let that be our prayer this morning. Let it be founded upon the gospel, this good news that, Father, lost, dead, broken people have been redeemed and restored and brought near to you. And because of that, we can pray and you hear so, Father, we just ask on the basis of what you've accomplished through redemption that you would begin strengthening all of us in this room. That, Father, that it wouldn't just be an external strength, a temporary transient thing. We know our outer man is wasting away. But, Father, that we'd be strengthened in the inner man, the inner being. So that, Father, as we're strengthened, we might become a dwelling place for your Son by faith. That, Father, that you might transform us and change us so that way Christ might be pleased with dwelling within us. That you'd be renovating our hearts, Father, this morning. And that, Father, that not only would we be strengthened in that way, but we'd be strengthened in our mind and heart in such a way that, Father, that, that we might grasp more fully and experience more deeply and know, Father, that, that you love us and your Son, Jesus, loves us so much and that through that, Father, we might mature and grow and develop. And, Father, we pray these, and, these things and ask these things for the church and for one another this morning because, Father, we we don't want to stay the same. We want to change for your glory. We want to be different. But, Father, not only do we want to change, ultimately we want you to be glorified in everything we do. We want our life to be a sacrifice, wholly pleasing to you. And so I pray that and ask that, Father, this morning that you might be glorified through the way that we live in this church, Father, moving forward, that you might be working and strengthening us inside so that we might glorify you. And so we love you, Father. We thank you. We praise you. In the precious name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.